Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. We'll just wait a couple of moments before we commence so that everyone can log on and be ready for the start. Thank you. So hello everybody, my name is Louise Colmeyer and I'm the Director of the ALERT program at Macquarie University. I'd like to warmly welcome you all and thank you for joining us for this webinar today. And I'd like to commence with a welcome to country or wherever you're watching this video. Welcome. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs of have... nurtured this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We welcome people of all nations and all faiths. Kwai Bidja, Jamna Payala Janawi. Come here, we speak together. We have 60,000 years of archaeological evidence of Aboriginal habitation at Lake Mungo and 20,000 years in Ride. We have great antiquity. Today, hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from Macquarie University. The Darug Nation had famous leaders such as Chief Yaramundi, Naraginji, Colby and Maria Locke. Many of the descendants of these Darug people live today amongst you. We celebrate with you our ongoing attachment and custodianship of this country. We celebrate the achievements of Macquarie University. Welcome. So it's wonderful that you've all joined us today for our webinar provided by the ALERT program at Macquarie University. We have a really exciting program for you today. And to begin with, I would like to just give an overview of our ALERT program here at Macquarie University. Before we invite our special guest speakers, we're very excited to have a, a patient who's going to share her story as well as members of our multidisciplinary team who work with us in our ALERT clinic. So for those who may not be aware, ALERT stands for the Australian Lymphedema Education, Research and Treatment Program. We are a multidisciplinary national and international flagship program at Macquarie University within the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Human Sciences. Our mission is to deliver high standard, personalised clinical care, following evidence-based education and innovative research in the field of lymphedema, lipedema and other chronic edemas. The three arms of our program, education, we offer continuing professional development programs for health professionals wanting to learn more about this condition, and we're also involved in teaching consumers, family members, and also students of Macquarie University who are undertaking a medical degree and also physiotherapy qualification. In our research arm of our program, 
We're involved in both in-house and externally sponsored research into the causes of lymphedema, lipedema and chronic edemas, and also strategies and outcomes of effective management. In our treatment, we have a conservative and surgical management for those at risk of or living with lymphedema, lipedema and other chronic conditions. Last year in 2020, we were actually recognised as a centre of excellence from LEARN, which stands for the Lymphatic Education and Research Network from the United States. And we were only one of 15 centres, only four of those being outside of the US given this status, which we were pretty excited about. These are members of our alert team. When we started back in 2012, we had two members on our team, and now we're a team of 26 individuals. We have a multidisciplinary approach, and we have medical specialists, allied health specialists, lymphedema therapists who are trained as occupational therapists and physiotherapists. We also have a research team who are involved in collecting data and being involved in various research studies. And we also have our education team, which involves our administration and support team who give us the support needed to run the program that we know as ALERT. We're really delighted that you have joined us today to learn more about this very condition that we're all passionate about. I just want to provide an overview of the three clinics that we run here at Macquarie University. We run a diagnostic clinic, and this is a clinic led by our multidisciplinary team of both medical and allied health professionals. This clinic specializes in diagnosing and accurately assessing lymphedema, lipedema, and other edemas using state-of-the-art diagnostic equipment. We have access to imaging, both MRI and lymphocentigraphy imaging through our partners here at MQ Health. And we're also involved in running indocyanine green lymphography assessments for those with this condition, which has also helped us in personalising the treatment for lymphedema using manual lymphatic drainage. And you'll hear more about this from a few of our speakers. We then have a conservative clinic and a, diet and a surgical clinic. In our conservative clinic, we offer all non-surgical treatment for those at risk of or living with primary lymphedema, secondary lymphedema after cancer treatment or other traumas. We offer head and neck lymphedema management, breast, trunk, abdominal and genital management, and also treatment for lipedemas. In our surgical clinic, we offer three surgical options, two of them for early stage lymphedema, which is lymphovenous anastomosis, which we call LVA, or lymph node transfer, known as LNT. And we offer liposuction surgery for those with more advanced stage lymphedema or lipedema. I would like to now introduce our first speaker, Rebecca Van Gelderen. Rebecca is a young mother who came to our alert clinic from Melbourne to have ICG lymphography after going through cancer treatment in 2020. You will learn more about ICG later in our webinar. But essentially, it's a procedure that lets us map the lymphatic system in real time so that you can see how the lymphatics are working and where any blockages or damage may be. So let's now welcome Rebecca and hear her story. Hi, my name is Rebecca and I'm a mother of two young boys living in Melbourne, Australia. Um, before COVID and before cancer, I was a researcher and lecturer at RMIT University in the bot lab and we did many things but my main focus was marine conservation. Um, during 2019 I noticed that my left leg started to swell. 
Um, but it wasn't until December that uh, I went to see a GP and he said, this is cancer. So he referred me on to the Peter McCallum Institute, which is um, in Melbourne. And I underwent a series of uh, tests and scans and biopsies. Um, and in late January of 2020, I was diagnosed with uh, liposarcoma of my left thigh. Low grade, um, well differentiated and very treatable. So that was fantastic news. In February of 2000, end of February 2020, I started radiotherapy and I did radiotherapy for five and a half weeks, five days a week. And then there was an eight week gap before my surgery, which took place first week of June 2020. Um, so, but in the, in the last couple of weeks of the radiotherapy, I noticed that my leg, my left thigh was swelling. It was getting a lot larger to the point where my biopsy scar had actually moved. It was visually noticeable. So I went back to the oncologist and she said, okay, well, let's do a scan to make sure that um, the radiotherapy is, you know, in the right place. And when they did the scan, they said, yeah, everything's fine. Um, they said, you probably have lymphedema. And that's the very first time I'd ever heard of, heard of lymphedema at all. Uh, but I didn't really think about it. Um, and then after that, for, bet between the radiotherapy and the surgery, as I said, it was eight weeks. I was basically bedridden at that time because my leg was huge. It was, it was, um, it, it impeded my mobility and my, um, to be able to function. Um, but when I had my surgery, so my surgery, they removed the tumor, which was three and a half kilograms. But they also had to take almost two out of my four quads. So I lost the intermedius, that whole, that whole muscle went, and most of the medius muscle. So what they did so that I could, would be able to walk again is they took an adductor muscle from my right leg and they grafted it onto what was left of the medius muscle. And I spent three and a half weeks in hospital and then a further six weeks at home in bed convalescing until I got the, the all clear to start physiotherapy and occupational therapy. In this time, um, I did ask about, you know, my leg being so big um, and I was told I would probably go down. Well, I started physiotherapy and occupational therapy and I didn't get very far very quickly. As I said, my leg was huge and lymphedema is not just swelling, it's excessive swelling that causes constant pain and it impedes your mobility, it impedes how you function. So the OT in particular was trying to get me into a shower and into a, in, using a toilet, but I, I couldn't even bend my leg to sit in a shower, I still had to have my legs stuck out of the shower and a bucket under my foot um, to even, you know, attempt to have a shower. When I went to the toilet, um, my le again, my leg was so huge. Um, it sounds strange, but I didn't know what direction the urine was going to go. It was frustrating, it was humiliating. And um, my leg just, I, I, yeah, I couldn't bend it. It was just problematic. So four and a half months after my surgery, I was referred back to Peter Mack for, um, to see a physiotherapist. And she said, oh, well, this looks like lymphedema. So um, she sent me to a lymphedema specialist in Melbourne, MIM, and um, she used the Mobiderm bandages, and after six weeks, I'd lost 11 centimetres from my left thigh, which was fantastic. And then subsequent, subsequently, she was able to get me into an auto-fit garment, a Mobiderm auto-fit garment, and then into compression stockings. But the issue mainly was for me was I was scared of my leg swelling up again and losing that mobility that I had. And every time my leg would swell, 
I would stop, elevate. Um, so again, my progress was really slow. Um, my aunt is Dr. Helen Mackey from Alert. And since my diagnosis, she would always keep tabs on me, you know, ring me, see how I'm going. And one time she called up and she explained the ICG to me and said, do you want to come up and get it done? And I couldn't have said yes fast enough um, because the main frustration I had was not knowing what was going on in my leg. I had no idea. So I made the flight to Sydney um, just. There was a bit of COVID, are we going, are we not going? But I made it and um, it was a fantastic day. I didn't realise how tired, frustrated and sad I was before the ICG compared to after. And, you know, you do hear people say that, you know, things are life-changing and it sounds like hyperbole. Well, in my case, it wasn't. I went from... I was investigating medical shoes and custom compression stockings and um, not knowing what my mobility was going to be um, to a bright future, happy, positive, with, you know, um, some normalcy on the horizon. So the ICG itself is really simple. And what I loved about it is that in real time, you can see what's going on. You can see the blockages. You can see those areas. And the thing for me is that before the ICG, I thought I have extensive lymphedema in my thighs, and I didn't. I have two patches. I have two areas. I have the smaller one is actually on my left leg where the radiotherapy happened. But both of my areas of lymphedema are associated with surgery scars. So the lymph nodes in my groin work. Um, the radiotherapy didn't affect that. Um, and yeah, my right leg, which didn't have the radiotherapy, has more lymphedema, but it also has a bigger scar because it was cut from groin to, to knee to get that adductor muscle out. So yeah, I, I went from having absolutely... <laughs> You know, um, thinking, you know, not, not, not knowing where my life was going and, and being very scared and being frightened about where I was going to end up. To after the ICG, I, um, I was still using a wheelchair in January. And within weeks of the ICG, I'd lost the wheelchair. Um, I went from two crutches to one crutch to a walking stick. And now I walk on my own. I don't walk normally, but... You know, I can walk on my own. Um, and I don't think I would have got here with, without doing the ICG at all. What was really great was that after it, I mean, again, you can clearly see where the blockages are, what's working, what's not. But then you go in and you discuss management strategies. And I got a full report. I learned about lymphedema massage, lymphedema exercises. I have extra mobiderm that I use. I have a, a laser light, handheld laser light that I use. Um, and I'm not afraid anymore of my legs swelling up to what it was before. I can easily manage it. Um, and as I said, my life has, it's, it's gone from negative to positive. Um, and I'd like to just finish off by saying thank you very much to the alert team, everyone at alert. Um, I had a great time and, you know, before, during and since, the alert team have been fantastic to me providing information and, and advice. Um, the ICG is something I would highly recommend um, and, in, you know, if you have any questions or concerns about lymphedema, I would check out the alert team at Macquarie University. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that very moving presentation and sharing of your story. And I'm glad that your trip to Sydney, even during COVID times, was valuable for you. We're really grateful that you gave that feedback. And I'm really glad that things are improving for you 
um, from a rehabilitation point of view and lymphedema point of view. So best wishes and we look forward to you answering some questions at the end of our, our session today. And I would like to invite all of you who are out there listening to these presentations today that we are going to have a panel of questions and answers after we've had our presentation from our team members. And I would ask you and invite you if you have any burning questions that come up as a result of these presentations, to please type in your question into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there, and we will do our best to answer some of those questions. Um, we have got lots of questions that many of you asked us prior to um, the session commencing today, um, but certainly we would ask for some live questions as well as you listen to these presentations. So our next speaker is actually Rebecca's aunt, who she referred to in her presentation, and that is the famous Dr. Helen Mackey. Helen is a rehabilitation specialist, and I say she's the lymphedema guru. She's the medical lead of our ALERT program here at Macquarie University, but she is really the most knowledgeable and experienced medical specialist in the country. And I feel so privileged to be working so closely with Helen in our program. So thank you, Helen, for giving this presentation, which has been entitled, Not All Swelling is Lymphedema. Thanks, Helen. So I'm going to be talking about um, edema, which doesn't necessarily um, mean lymphedema. And really just giving an overview of this complex system within our body. So just a few terms. Swellings, the word swelling is a pretty non-specific, um, non-medical term, but we use it all the time nevertheless. It uh, can be related to bruising or um, other injuries, um, infection, uh, swelling, during, uh, swelling during the heat of the day. Um, Whereas edema is a medical term which indicates a dysfunction or imbalance of the complex fluid systems of our body, often involving the kidney, the liver, or the heart, and a number of different bodily um, organs. It can be a component of healing or it can be in the cause further injury. Chronic edema is a term that we use for persistent edema for more than three months. And it always indicates a lymphatic dysfunction. Not necessarily could be because the, the lymphatics are overwhelmed, or it could be that the lymphatics are just not um, good enough. Uh, it's an umbrella diagnosis for a number of different conditions, including lymphedema, and the edema associated with vein problems, obesity, and even heart failure when it's very chronic. Our body requires um, a stable amount of fluid in the body uh, to remain healthful, he healthy, because this require this, this allows a stable level of salt concentration, and this fluid balance in our body is promoted by lots of different mechanisms, both in the fluid itself, in terms of the concentration of salts, um, in the heart. heart and blood vessels, which is the cardiovascular system, and in the kidney system. But there's a lot of other complex balancing mechanisms in our body. Just going to talk a little bit about some of the movement of fluid in, in our body, um, because the lymphatics are part of the cardiovascular system. But our cardiovascular system has what we call hemodynamics, that is the, the movement of blood. Now, the blood um, in our body is uh, five litres, and it's moved by the heart, pumping it every around our body three times every minute. So the heart, during our lifetime of 70 years, pumps 2.5 billion times. And its job is to take oxygen to and from our, uh, to our, our cells in our body. The lymphatics um, are part of the uh, system, but basically bringing fluid that's 
left behind in the tissue back into the circulation. And around about 10% of the nine litres that are returned to our circulation each day comes from the arms or, and legs. The rest of it uh, primarily comes from the liver and from the gut because our gut absorbs um, fat and the fat is taken um, through the lymphatics back to the liver. Another job of our lymphatics is to clean the blood plasma. Now, the blood plasma is that part of the blood which doesn't contain the red blood cells. And this is drained from, this drains into the tissue and then is transported through our lymph nodes where it's cleaned. And this occurs every full cleaning of the blood plasma occurs every nine hours. There's, there's a number of different ways our body actually gets rid of fluid as well. So the main way our body gets rid of fluid, um, which is excess to its need, is through the kidney, where the blood um, is brought to the kidney, um, and then the, the um, electrolytes and fluids are balanced and excess fluid is expelled as urine. Our gut also plays a part in, in that. Um, and you must remember when, um, if you have an infection of the gut, uh, you can become rapidly dehydrated with um, uh, diarrhea. So it's a, it's a way of actually getting rid of fluid. Um, in the same way, our skin um, sweats. And if you're exercising very hard in hot weather, again, you can become quite rapidly dehydrated because of the amount of sweat that is removed from the body. And finally, in the COVID hour days, we know that droplets are expelled when we breathe out, and that's a way of also removing fluids. So there's a, quite a complex system of, of fluid in and out of our body and within our body itself. So next, I'm just going to be talking about how these issues present to to the doctor, um, sometimes myself, but mo most often to your GP. And often it, it's a presentation of a complaint of swelling. So firstly, the swelling, the presentation or the concern that your body is swollen is very, very rarely a pure lymphatic problem. It's um, more likely to be associated with um, complex kidney failure or or drugs, in particular things like facial swelling is particularly associated with kidney problems or allergic problems or corticosteroids. Um, abdominal swelling or bloating um, can be associated with liver disease, obesity, um, irritable bowel syndrome and so on. Lots of corticosteroids and other medications, heart failure and kidney failure can give a generalised fluid retention that we can feel um, be described as fluid body swelling. And finally, when you have fluid retention for various reasons, it's often going to occur in your legs simply because of, of gravity. Drugs can cause uh, peripheral edema and commonly can make things like lymphedema a little worse. Um, so some of our medications for blood pressure will cause problems. Um, we, our breast cancer patients know very well that Taxol's a common problem, uh, causes swelling in the, in, in the arm. Um, uh, during a treatment for breast cancer, corticosteroids used, for instance, in um, management of multiple sclerosis exacerbation can cause uh, quite significant swelling in the legs, and other lots of other medications can cause some edema. It's important when you do get swelling, which you may be associated with a new medication or an a medication that you are careful in Googling because the information can be quite confusing and may not so be associated with a problem that you've got. So I would recommend that you um, certainly have a talk to your GP about uh, these, this problem. For the alert 
patient, a major, vast majority of our patients, 90% of them with presenting with a swollen arm will be because of breast cancer. But in the real world of general practice, um, often the presentation of the swollen arm or hand may not have a cancer history, in which case we've, we really need to look at very carefully about how this happened and, and to do the examinations, particularly um, picking up whether there's pain associated, whether there's congestion of the veins might indicating a clot, shortness of breath might indicate heart failure, and all these things need to be investigated. The legs present a, another major problem, um, swelling of the legs, even when it's chronic edema, therefore probably has an underlying lymphatic problem. There are many causes for this problem. For instance, um, poor return of blood in the in the veins because of vein, venous, that's um, varicose, varicose veins, etc. Um, a clot in the calf muscles, either causing acute or immediate swelling and um, needing to be treated, or in the long term after a clot um, has occurred. Lymphedema, of course, can be primary or secondary. Lipedema can be quite a painful discomfort in the limbs that might present as swelling. Um, and of course, obes obesity um, can cause a vascular lymphedema um, in very big people. Um, other causes of uh, common causes of lymphedema might be immobility, particularly sleeping in a chair for, for various reasons. But just remember for the general, pra general practitioner, Swollen legs are much more likely to be associated with a heart or kidney disease rather than a lymphedema problem. In fact, the diagnosis of swollen legs in the elderly is very complicated and difficult because many of the conditions may coexist that cause this swelling. So you may have heart failure or kidney failure, uh, poor mobility, particularly sleeping in, in chairs, uh, poor uh, veins and also just the old age changes in lymph nodes and the lymph pat pump that can affect this um, swelling. And it's important to remember that the treatment for lymphedema in an older person in the presence of heart failure can result in fluid on the lungs, which can be quite very distressing. So it's very important to make a diagnosis. So if we go on, there are lots of other causes for swelling in the legs. It's quite a diagnostic journey for everyone and for your GP to exclude a number of these other conditions. So just looking at um, the type of swelling that we see in the legs associated with vein problems, and you can see in that picture that there's a pigmentation of the skin um, below the knees and um, between the ankle and, the, and usually about the mid calf. Um, it can, there can be varicose veins associated and the shape of the leg changes to, in women we call it champagne bottle legs and in men we call it beer bottle legs, but it's a narrowing and tightening of the ankle. Um, and, and this is one of important diagnosis that we need to make for the legs. Finally, we're just, just going to talk a little bit about lipedema. This is a condition that often presents to uh, GP or to uh, us at the alert clinic of swelling in, in both legs where there's a, uh, in women, um, where there's a change, a fatty change, bruising, tenderness and pain associated with this condition, which is um, causes a disproportion between the upper and lower body. And here we see a mother and her daughter, a grandmother and her daughter uh, with the same condition because it can run in families. Um, swelling is associated, but it's rarely associated actual lymphedema. This swelling is the swelling that uh, develops in during the day. It collects in the cuff around the ankle of people with lipedema. It can be easily moved by uh, pump and with um, garments, but luckily it's not a truly a lymphatic problem until it 
Um, so, but it is worthwhile treating. So just the message is that edema is quite complex and can be quite difficult to sort out. Getting the diagnosis right is important, but it may actually have many diff several different causes in the same person. Um, and I guess I'm just asked that to, to think a little bit about um, the difficulty sometimes of, of um, getting this right uh, for the general practitioner. So thank you very much for listening to that. I hope this is helpful and um, we'll just say thank you very much and um, be very happy to uh, have any of your questions. Um, and I hope we'll, you've enjoyed the, the talk we've just given you. Thank you very much, Helen, for that very informative presentation. I do encourage you to send in questions for us to answer during our panel session. And hopefully we're all a little bit inspired by Helen's presentation that often people who attend these types of educational events are often more educated and informed than their own health professionals, medical specialists that you're going to on a regular basis. So hopefully we can help to teach others about the importance of um, this condition. So thank you. We're going to move on now to Asha Hayden-White. Asha is our senior therapist and leader of our therapist team here at the ALERT program. And she's going to talk to us about ICG imaging, which is, stands for Indesign Green Lymphography. Ash is going to talk about what it is, how it works, and how it can be used in lymphedema and lipedema management. Hello, my name is Asha Hayden-White. I'm the team leader and senior lymphedema therapist of MQ Health Lymphedema Clinic which forms the treatment arm of the ALERT program at Macquarie University. Today, I'm going to be speaking about endocyanine green or ICG lymphography and its application in ongoing management. ICG lymphography is a lymphatic imaging technique that we use in our clinic. It involves the injection um, of a small amount of ICG dye, usually at four injection sites within the limb or the affected tissue. ICG dye, once injected, is transported by our lymphatic system. This dye has fluorescent properties in the near-infrared range. And what that means is we can use a near-infrared scanning camera, seen here in this image, to visualise the lymphatic vessels and also the transport of lymphatic fluid through these vessels in real time. Before I go further about ICG lymphography, I just want to give a little bit of an overview about our lymphatic anatomy so that you can understand what you're seeing in some of the images and videos that I show. So our lymphatic system consists of a network of lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes, with one of the main functions being to transport lymphatic fluid from the tissue all the way back up to the vascular system at our neck, as Dr. Mackey's already described. Our, there are two main parts of our lymphatic system. The first is a superficial lymphatic system, which sits within the skin and just below the skin. And then we have a deep lymphatic system that sits close, where the lymphatic vessels run closer to the muscle and the bone. And when people develop lymphedema, um, especially secondary lymphedema, we primarily see it occur in this superficial lymphatic system. And it's this superficial lymphatic system that we can visualise with the ICG lymphography. So in our superficial system, we have um, some different lymphatic vessels. We have our tiny little lymphatic capillaries which sit within the skin. And this is a network of little vessels within the skin. These vessels um, function to transport fluid from the tissue uh, into la slightly larger lymphatic vessels called pre-collectors, which then drain fluid into even larger vessels called collecting vessels. 
Now, lymphatic collecting vessels are unique. They have a layer of muscle around the vessel wall, which enables them to contract or to pump fluid. They also have these valves at quite regular intervals along the vessel. And these valves stop um, the fluid from backflowing down the vessel. When we do an ICG on a person without lymphedema, what we see is the movement of lymphatic fluid and the dye through those lymphatic collecting vessels. So this is a video of a person, a person without lymphedema. We can see injection sites at the wrist, and then we're seeing the lymphatic collecting vessels travel up the arm towards lymph nodes in the armpit. Now, when lymphedema develops, we see changes to the lymphatic vessels. And these changes can be seen on ICG lymphography. They've also been shown to be diagnostic of lymphedema. So the most common change that we see is something we call dermal backflow. In this video, we're going to see, the, so this is the normal movement of lymphatic fluid through the lymphatic collecting vessel. Now, when we have damage or obstruction to a lymphatic collecting vessel, which occurs in lymphedema, fluid can no longer flow along that vessel. So the body tries to find a way to compensate. And what it does is it pushes the fluid back up to the skin and it uses those tiny little lymphatic capillaries within the skin to move the fluid instead. And what we've found is that the movement of fluid through these tiny little lymphatic capillaries is directional. And it wants to go in a direction towards something that's working. So for example, it will either go in a direction towards another lymphatic collecting vessel that's working, um, and then it takes the fluid away. Or in some people with lymphedema, we find that there is actually no lymphatic collecting vessels working in, anymore. And so these lymphatic capillaries will transport the fluid all the way up, for example, the arm towards lymph nodes that are working. And when we see this movement of the lymphatic fluid through the capillaries, this is what we call dermal backflow. So this is an ICG image of an arm. We're seeing some lymphatic collecting vessels here working, but as we get to the elbow, we start to see the lymphatic fluid and the ICG dye spread out within the tissue. And that's dermal backflow. And these are the little lymphatic capillaries within the skin. And so, there's a damage to the lymphatic collecting vessel. The body's trying to compensate, push the fluid up to the little lymphatic capillaries within the skin to try and find a different way to drain the fluid. A second change that we see in lymphedema is what we call compensatory drainage pathways. So normally we see a limb or a body area drain to a specific uh, lymph node region. So for example, in the leg, we often see the leg drain up to the lymph nodes in the groin. However, if these lymph nodes are damaged or they maybe they've been removed in surgery for cancer treatments, the leg may no longer be able to drain to these lymph nodes. And we start to see the body try to compensate for this. And we see these additional drainage pathways to other areas of the body where there's other lymph nodes that might be working. So for example, this patient with leg lymphedema, we can see that dermal backflow pattern coming all the way up the leg. Now, because it can, can no longer drain to the lymph nodes in the groin, we're seeing these additional lymphatic pathways coming across and draining to the groin on the opposite leg. So this is a video showing the same thing so I'll just forward there. So we're at the thigh here, the front of the thigh. And as we get to the groin, we, this drainage pathway is blocked. And so we're seeing the drainage come across the top of the underpants here, across the pubic area towards the opposite um, groin lymph nodes. So how do we use ICG lymphography at alert? 
We use ICG to help us to diagnose and assess lymphedema and other chronic edemas through visualisation of those changes that I've just described. We can also use ICG to help us rule out a diagnosis of lymphedema. So for example, if someone presents to our clinic with swelling in their leg with an unknown cause, if we do an ICG and we see that there's normal lymphatics, then we can say it's not lymphedema and we can help direct that person um, to have maybe further investigations to try and understand what's causing the swelling in their leg. We've also used ICG um, to help us assess and diagnose lipedema, and we've found that in a high proportion of the patients with lipedema that they've actually got normal lymphatics on ICG lymphography. We also use ICG lymphography to help us determine um, patients' eligibility for lymphatic surgery and to evaluate the outcomes of those surgeries. So specifically, that's referring to surgeries such as lymphovenous anastomosis or lymph node transfer surgeries for patients with lymphedema. Today, um, I'm not going to go into detail about those surgeries. However, if you would like more information, um, you can visit our website or please feel free to contact our clinic if you would like to speak to someone about those. Finally, we use ICG to help provide patients with a personalised management plan for their lymphedema. Using what we see on ICG lymphography, it can help provide recommendations about a person's compression garments, um, maybe about the settings that they use if they're using a compression pump, and help us to um, direct and maybe improve manual lymphatic drainage or self-lymphatic drainage techniques. So in reference to manual lymphatic drainage, ICG lymphography can show us the exact direction in which the lymphatic fluid is draining to. So for example, in this um, image here, this is an ICG chart that we do for patients. Um, we can see that this patient with leg lymphedema is no longer draining to their groin lymph nodes. Instead, they're draining across to their um, other leg, to the groin lymph nodes on the other side, but they're also draining up over their um, buttock region to what we call the gluteal drainage area, which sits near the tailbone. So understanding this can help tailor a person's um, manual lymphatic drainage sequence so that um, hopefully it can improve their outcomes. With ICG, we can also see exactly where the areas of dermal backflow or congestion are and the direction in which this is draining. And so we draw on an ICG chart with arrows, the direction in which we see that dermal backflow um, moving. And so um, if a patient has a local therapist or if they do their own lymphatic drainage, they know exactly which direction to take their massage. Finally, we use ICG to help us um, change or improve the effectiveness of our technique. Um, so it might change the way in, um, in which we apply the massage, the pressure and the speed that we use. We often in clinic, um, we get patients while they're having ICG to actually practice their self-lymphatic drainage and make sure that their hand movements are being effective in moving the lymphatic fluid. What we've found is that we need to change the pressure and the speed of our massage depending on what we're seeing with ICG. So if we're seeing um, lymphatic collecting vessels working here, we know that these vessels have their own pump. And so the pressure and the speed that we apply to manual lymphatic drainage, the pressure doesn't have to be very firm and we can do it fairly quickly. But if we see areas of dermal backflow, we are using those tiny little lymphatic capillaries within the skin to move the fluid. Now those lymphatic capillaries, remember, don't have a pump. And so our pressure needs to be slightly firmer and our speed needs to be slower to be effective in moving the lymphatic fluid. Now, you might be thinking, what if I can't have an ICG? What can I do? 
So we at Macquarie have now undertaken over a thousand ICG lymphography assessments on patients. And so we have a good um, data set to be able to analyze. And we've recently published the drainage regions that we've observed in patients with lymphedema following cancer treatment. So in patients with arm lymphedema related to cancer treatment, we've found that the majority of patients drain to the, still drain to their armpit on the same side. If this is their arm with lymphedema, they still drain to, this, um, to the armpit. The second most common drainage pathway is to what we call the clavicular region. So lymph nodes above or below the collarbone. What we've also found is that people with milder arm lymphedema are more likely to drain to this armpit and this clavicular region compared with people with more severe lymph arm lymphedema. Now we've also seen other drainage areas to the breastbone here. So we see that the drainage comes up over the front of the shoulder, across the chest to the breastbone, and or sometimes across to right away across to the opposite armpit. In a very small amount of patients, we've actually seen the drainage come up over the back of the shoulder to the back of the shoulder blade here. What we've seen that these drainage areas are more common um, in people with more severe arm lymphedema. So if you've got more severe arm lymphedema and usually we see the swelling coming right up to the shoulder here, then you might find that you get more effective outcomes if you take your drainage across either to the breastbone or the opposite armpit. Now, some of you might um, spend time in your massage draining down to your groin lymph nodes. Um, now, what we've found in the over 300 patients that we've done with arm lymphedema is we've never seen the arm drain down to the groin lymph nodes. So if you're currently doing this, this might be something you want to discuss with your local therapist and decide if maybe this is something you might want to change in your current management. Now, if you have leg lymphedema related to cancer treatment, now, if this is the affected leg, We've seen 52% of patients continue to drain to the groin lymph nodes on the same side. And we've seen 26 drain to the back of the knee. And these are the normal drainage pathways of the leg. Similar to the arm, we've seen that if you have milder leg lymphedema, you're more likely to drain to these areas. We've then seen 31% of um, patients drain across the pubic area to the opposite groin lymph nodes. We then have seen these other drainage regions. So we call this the lateral thigh drainage region, 15%, posterior thigh, so the back of the thigh, 14%, the gluteal, 22%, and up to the armpit, 9%. Now, these are only seen when we have, um, or more commonly seen when we have more severe um, lymphedema. We also undertook a pilot study looking at the drainage regions of the breast in um, people with breast edema following breast cancer. So if this is the effect of breast, we did still see 40% drain to the same armpit. The majority of patients, 60% drain to um, the sternal region. We did see 40% come all the way across to the opposite armpit. Then we also saw drainage to what we call the intercostal area. So this is on the lateral or the, um, just the side of the rib cage and some drained up to that clavicular or collarbone area. So these are directions you might try to massage if you have breast edema. Now, we also do have data for primary leg lymphedema and, also, and lipedema and other secondary non-cancer related lymphedemas. And we're currently in the process of writing up those up. So hopefully this year we'll have publications to report on those. In the breast, I just also like to say we haven't seen any um, patients drained down to the groin similar to the arm. So thank you for your time today. Um, I would encourage you if you've got any questions about um, 
lymphedema or ICG to visit our website or please contact our clinic if you would like to discuss um, ICG further. Thank you for your time today. Excellent. Thank you, Asha, for that fantastic presentation. And um, it's been fascinating for me as a lymphedema therapist to be able to see ICG and it really opens up your eyes to what's happening beneath the skin. So great presentation and please feel free to type in any questions in the Q&A function of the Zoom setup to be able to ask questions to our panel about anything that you've heard of today um, during our session. Now we're up to our final presentations so that we can allow a lot of time for questions and answers with members of our multidisciplinary team. And I'd like to introduce one of our senior therapists, Kim Toya, the lymphedema therapist and physiotherapist. And Kim is going to speak to us today about how you can manage your lymphedema on a day-to-day -day basis. As we all know, you're living with this condition day in, day out. And hopefully Kim's going to give you some tips and tricks about how to manage your own condition and also if you don't have access to the ICG, how also we can use the results from our research in being able to manage the condition at home. Thanks, Kim. Thank you for Louise for introducing me and thank you everyone for your interest in this alert webinar on strategies for self-management of lymphedema. My hope is to broaden your options for managing your lymphedema. So the key word there is management. I'd like to introduce the concept of, of a there's no magic wand. <laughs> Lymphedema is a chronic condition. There's no, no cure yet. So we need to focus on managing it, controlling it, regulating it, keeping the signs and symptoms to a minimum. That means the dosage of management depends on the degree of your issues. So what does that mean? And that's where the concept of a toolbox is helpful. So what would you put in your toolbox if you're collecting options or building your toolbox of strategies? You've probably heard these before. There's rarely one strategy, much more likely to be several that you mix up, mix and matches, depending what the issues are. So skin care, exercise and activity, compression garments, manual lymphatic drainage, what you might call massage, sequential pumps, and self-monitoring and self-assessment. So skin care. Skin care is an easy daily habit. It includes gently washing your skin, moisturising, protecting from damage, like gloves or socks or long pants, long sleeves, inspecting the condition of your skin for dryness, damage, or perhaps signs of infection. So I like to think of moisturising a bit like, what would you do for a sticky date pudding? So if your skin is a sticky date pudding, you want the syrup to soak in. You want it to be rich and lush. You don't just want it a little bit. You don't just want it sitting on top. So we want quality moisturiser. We want time and action for it to soak in. We want to be able, that gives you time to inspect your skin, to feel and see what's going on. If your skin's healthy on the outside, it's also gonna be healthy on the inside. So how do you make it a daily habit? Well, a daily habit means that you might put your moisturiser bottle with your towel or undies. So after you shower, you rub it, the rub the moisturiser in, not just rub it on. Or maybe if the moisturiser is a difficult thing to add in, maybe that's where you use a shower oil as an option. So once you finish the shower, water's off, a little bit of oil rubbed in all over your limb. By the time you've grabbed your towel, it's already soaked in. If skincare is a daily habit, so should the next option, and that's exercise. So exercise and activity is an important aspect of keeping your lymphatic system moving. So there's lots of options. Really, it should be something you enjoy, something you can keep doing. Really, more than you're doing now would be a good thing. Start at a comfortable level, increase gradually, set small goals and have tangible re rewards. Things like if you've, if you've done five walks, you get to buy a plant for the garden or you're aiming to do three activities a week until that's a comfortable level before you're aiming for four times a week. 
So why is exercise important for lymphedema? Well, really, exercise benefits every system of the body, your brain, your heart, your immunity, your mental health, really everything. But specifically for lymphedema, exercise and activity will activate your muscle pump. If you look at the diagram, when the muscle's bulging, it's pushing, squashing the lymphatic vessel and the fluid inside will be pushed up and there's valves that stop it from coming back. But also the more your muscles are active, the more the actual vessel will pulse, a bit like a snake swallowing an egg. This also helps to move fluid up against gravity. So we often refer to the COSA statement and it refers specifically to cancer recovery, but really it's a helpful statement for, for exercise in general. Let's break it down. You want to avoid inactivity. So break up your standing or sitting or inactivity. Make it 30 minute blocks, perhaps five minutes of walking for every 30 minutes you're sitting down. Maybe if you're watching TV, every ad break, you stand up, walk around, do your resistance band or grab some weights or just something so that an hour is not an hour of sitting. Progress towards. Now that means you don't start with 150 minutes. That means you progress towards. You start with something gentle, more than you're doing now. Moderate intensity. Well, moderate intensity for you is gonna be different to moderate intensity for someone else. But if we're thinking of aerobic exercise, you want it as something that's going to make you breathe faster and deeper. And resistance makes you feel like your muscles are doing some work. So enough for you to feel that they're making that you are working harder. So whether you're doing it for your lymphedema or doing it for your general health, you're going to feel better. The next strategy is compression garments. Um, there's lots of options when it comes to compression garments. Um, there's ready to wear, there's circular knit, there's custom made, there's cut and sew. There's how often do you replace them? Do you layer them? Is it single layer? Do you wear them by day? Do you wear them at night? Do you wear them both? There's lots of options and that's all about working out what your dosage needs to be. But I'd like you to sort of think of two groups. So you might have your everyday garments, what, what's your usual maintenance, your base sleeve or stocking? It's a comfortable compression class. You wear it most of the time. You might not wear it overnight. It probably hasn't got any extra bits you add in. Whereas when you need more than that because you're feeling a bit swollen, you're recovering from cellulitis, it's been very hot weather, you've been less active, whatever reason you need more, you might add an extra layer, an overlap layer you might have a stronger compression class. You have class two stockings on your normal every day, but maybe class three when you need more. You might wear them more hours a day or more days of the week. You might add an overnight garment if you're not doing so well. You might add in extra pads or shapes or, or lumpy bumpy foam as texture. So what's your everyday, your maintenance garments, and what's your extra dosage that you add when you need more? And that sort of maintenance and increased management is also what we might use for the next strategy, which is manual lymphatic drainage or what people might call massage. So Asher already introduced the manual lymphatic drainage when she was talking about the ICG lymphography mapping. What you've been taught, what you might be doing, might perhaps might need to change a bit to be effective. If you've never really done it before or you did it a bit, but you didn't find it really helped. Maybe that's because your style needs to change. So if we think of four aspects of that. So what we need to do is think about the drainage region and the sequence. So the sequ the, in the chart that Asha was talking about, the, the ICG she showed, the drainage region was to the other side of gro the groin and the groin on the other side, I mean, and to the low back. So that's where we want to move everything to. You'd start at the hip and move to the back and to the groin. So starting close and finishing far. Once that's softened and changed, then you'd move down into the thigh, then the lower leg, then the foot. And you can see there's lots of arrows. It's very directional. 
and everyone's direction might be a bit different, but we do have patterns that we can follow, patterns that we might be able to predict. Those, those drainage regions might be different to what you've been taught, but hopefully you have been taught that start close and finish far. The next aspect is the pressure and the speed. So with pressure and speed, that's also something that might be different to what you've done before. So firmer and slower. If you haven't felt a difference before, um, you might want to try a little bit firmer and a little bit slower. So you're aiming where it, the fluid's likely to be draining to, you're starting close and finishing far, you're using firmer pressures at slower speeds, and all of that should add up to feeling a difference. If you're not feeling a difference with the manual drainage, then changing it, changing one or more of those aspects to try to get the result that you should be feeling, perhaps looser and lighter. The next one is se sequential pumps, and they they're helpful perhaps if you don't have the same endure, the, the endurance or the, the hand dexterity that you might need to do the manual lymphatic drainage. So this is this slide shows one of many models out there. You're wanting the settings to provide the same sort of model that we get with manual lymphatic drainage. So firmer pressures, slower speeds. And they can perhaps go for 30 or even 60 minutes, which to do that with your hands might be very tiring. When the pump's finished, you want to feel a difference. One thing I would say with the, man, with the sequential pumps is that you might then use your hand to do that manual lymphatic drainage to the drainage regions. So for this picture, it shows someone with leg pump garments on. If that was the person in that mapping that we showed you before, they might use their hand to drain the top of the thigh from the side of the hip up and across the front of the, the pelvic area and round the side of the hip to the back. So they're doing that top bit that, to get it to the drainage region. So that sort of leads really nicely into self-monitoring and self-assessment. You don't want to just keep doing the same thing all the time. If you're not feeling a difference with your pump, if you're not feeling a difference with your manual lymphatic drainage or your garments, well, maybe that's where you need to be paying a bit more attention to what is making a difference and try a different dosage of your options. So with the manual lymphatic drain, uh, sorry, with the self-monitoring assessment, you'd be wanting to look and feel. Does it feel heavy? Does it look different? different? Feeling of heaviness and fatigue is something that some people say. You might actually be objective and measure with a tape, try and get some circumferences at where there's a certain freckle or skin mark at a certain point on your limb. Do you fit your clothing? Does your bra feel tight whenever your breast swells? Do your shoes not fit as well? Is that watch now feeling really tight around your wrist? Can you make the skin pit? Can you make pitting happen where you shove your thumb in and get that fluid moving? Do you have the contours around your ankles or elbows or the top of your hand or foot like you usually do? Or is it disappearing earlier in the day? Is it worse at the end of the day than it usually is? So just keeping an eye on things to show, are you managing your lymphedema well or do you need to start changing the dosage of what you're doing? So the final one I'd like to throw in is a local therapist. Um, they're a really helpful tool in your toolbox because they're going to help you with all of those aspects that we've covered already. There's new options all the time to help you make managing your lymphedema easier. So what can your local therapist do? Well, they can educate you. They're, they're keeping up to date on what's going on with lymphedema so they can pass that on to you. They can help you understand what's going on. Why is it happening? Why is cellulite such a bad thing? Why do you need to be doing your manual lymphatic drainage? Why do compression garments only last a certain amount of time? You also need a cheer squad. You need someone to encourage you when things aren't going the way you want them to or to celebrate with you when they are. You need them for assessment. How, how do you clarify what's going on? How do you monitor? What are the signs you're looking for? You also to adapt your 
strategies. Is it more about using your manual lymphatic drainage because you want to use your garments less? Is it a different sort of garment that could be helping you? We're getting new products all the time. So keeping up on the options that are yours. Guidance, how to navigate our recovering from cellulitis or the different state funding schemes for garments. And it also might be to have regular therapy. And those therapy times are a really good chance to check in and see what's happening for you. So I hope that that's given you lots of options to put in your toolbox. Perhaps take a moment just to think of which one or more of those you'd like to discuss with your local therapist. What could you be doing better? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kim, for that excellent presentation. And hopefully there might be something in Kim's toolbox that you haven't thought about or you haven't tried for a while that may be useful in pulling out of the toolbox and helping you to guide your own self-management to help improve your own condition. So we now come to the time where it's Q&A, questions and answers time. And I'd like to invite our panel members to turn on their cameras and microphone for a Q&A session. And while they're coming on to this session, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There's technology here. And I'm going to actually ask for a little bit of audience participation today. We have a poll that we are going to put up on the screen. And everyone has about 30 seconds to answer a question. There's only one answer per person, but we'd like to know who's in our audience today. Are you somebody living with lymphedema or lipedema or another condition, or are you a health professional? That will help us to target future events in the future. And we really appreciate you pressing on the, the option that most suits you. And while that's happening, I'd like to introduce our panel members for today. In addition to our presenters from today's education sessions, we're also joined by Associate Professor Hiro Swami. Hiro trained as a plastic surgeon, but his main field of expertise is research into lymphatic anatomy. Um, we call him our hero. Um, Hero developed the concept of visualising the lymphatics by mapping the body into defined territories called lymphosomes. We're also joined by a plastic surgeon, Dr. Kwan No. Give us a wave, Kwan, that you're here. Just come out of theatre by the looks of it, Kwan. And also Associate Professor Thomas Lamb. Now, Thomas, I'm not sure that he's on with us at the moment. He has been in theatre all day today and he may join us a little late, but both Thomas and Kwan are plastic surgeons who are very vital members of our multidisciplinary team and offer surgical options for lymphedema and lipedema in our clinic. So welcome. We've also received many questions prior to the start of the webinar and then we've had a good run of questions coming through the Q&A chat function during this webinar and we continue to ask you to ask us questions. What I will say is that we may be here all night if we were to ask individual answer individual questions. So what we have done prior to the session is group those questions that were already sent to us into themes. So there were lots of commonalities in the questions that came to us. So we've grouped them into themes. But please don't be anxious or concerned if your question hasn't been answered by the time we finish this webinar, because as a team, we will group the questions together and provide a summary of the themes of the questions that you have asked us, and we will provide answers in the next couple of weeks to you. We're also recording this session so that you will be able to go back and listen to it again, and we will send everybody who's registered for this um, webinar session um, a, a link to be able to review it again and also answers to the question. So I'm going to start off um, our first question to Rebecca, our beautiful patient who shared our story. And um, I'll ask, first of all, Rebecca, we've had a few questions, very impressed with your story and grateful that you shared the story with us. And some people have said that they know some, some days are better than others living with this condition. 
And some people notice that the swelling becomes worse after some different activities compared to other activities. And just wondering if you could share your experience and how you've coped with the ups and downs of living with this condition. And I will ask all the panel members, if you don't mind putting your cameras on, because we're going to make this session quite interactive. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Over to you. Okay. Um, yeah, well, before the ICG, I'd probably say that my um, control of things was sort of nowhere. Um, I, I still swell on a daily basis. Um, my leg is always heavy by the end of the day, um, and I can, I can feel it. I wear compression stockings every day. Um, I've got class one compression stockings that I wear. Um, I, have a, I have a little bit of a routine. Um, talking about going back to um, Kim's toolbox, which is, was really good. So I start off with every morning, um, the laser light thing that I was talking about in my presentation is this thing. Um, but that's because I have big scars. And it's mainly for the softening and um, coping with those those scars, scar areas. Um, so yeah, I wear my compression stockings at night. At, at the moment, I don't wear anything, but um, my management is my mainly my compression stockings and a bit of lymphatic uh, massage. But if things get uh, a bit out of control, I use the auto fit at night. And sometimes I know that if I've been increasing up in my physiotherapy lately, and so I might put the auto fit on the night before, sort of preempting almost, and then wearing that the night of. I also find that sometimes um, what really works quite well, um, and I found this over the summer because heat's not particularly good, um, is that if I use compression with elevation, and my mother actually bought me a a pillow that's sort of it's to elevate your legs it's specifically to elevate your legs and I can put my auto fit on and use that pillow and I, I find that overnight that again I get a, a really good outcome so for me it's I yeah I have a couple of things in my toolbox that um, I can go to I hope that on, thank you that's great thank you for kicking us off with that first question and a real life question which is important I'm going to move on. I'm going to ask you a question, Asha, as our one of our lymphedema therapists on the panel. Um, but we've had had quite a few questions about exercise and using exercise as one of our uh, management tools in our toolbox. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to make a few comments about exercise regimes, including weight exercises, so resistive training, weight exercises, and how do people start? and gradually increase? Is there a maximum weight? Um, are people going to damage themselves if they're not an exercise person and then start? So general some comments about exercise. Thanks, Asha. Sure, Louise. It's a very big area to try and cover, um, but I'll do my best. And I think Kim's presentation already touched on that and the COSA recommendations. So I won't go over that again, um, but we do know the benefits of exercise um, just in general and in especially in people after cancer treatment um, in helping to prevent risk of recurrence um, in specifically in regards to lymphedema um, we know that exercise has been shown um, if you're at risk of developing lymphedema um, that it's been shown that it doesn't cause lymphedema and there's some evidence to show that participating in regular exercise um, can reduce your risk of developing lymphedema. Um, for those people with lymphedema um, we know that um, or research has shown us that exercise doesn't make lymphedema worse um, and that potentially regular exercise can reduce the symptoms of lymphedema. Um, there's no, we don't know, we think every, any type of exercise is good, whether it's aerobic, which is your walking and your running and that sort of thing, and resistance exercise. Um, in regards to compression garments, if you've got lymphedema, um, you 
we encourage people to wear compression garments while they're exercising. But if it's something that stops you from exercising, um, have that discussion with your lymphedema therapist, whether you want to remove your garment to exercise. We'd much rather you exercise than not. Uh, there was a study that was done that showed that um, people, if they exercise, if they had lymphedema and they exercise without their compression garment on, there was an initial increase in their lymphedema. But after 24 hours, that um, uh, their symptoms had returned to their pre-exercise level. Um, in regards to resistance exercise or weights, uh, what I would typically recommend my, to my patients, if they've never exercised before or never done any weights, we always recommend starting um, at the minimum weight um, and just be uh, sensible and slowly and gradually build up what you're doing. So you want to slowly and gradually build up the weight, but also the number of repetitions of that exercise that you're doing. Um, and also make sure that you've got really good technique. So we want to make sure you're lifting the weights correctly because we don't want to cause any uh, trauma to the tissue and or any other injury to the tissue. I would encourage people that if you do want to get into exercise or um, into specifically into weights and you don't normally um, exercise, you might want to discuss it with your local lymphedema therapist um, or there's other avenues. You could um, go and see an exercise physiologist. And there's a lot of um, community groups out there um, uh, if you want to be involved in a group setting. So if you've, for example, in New South Wales, there's the Encore program for women after breast cancer treatment. Um, there's also uh, the Cancer Council run a number of exercise classes. And um, there's also other things like the Heart Foundation that run walking groups and things like that. And then you're just in a supervised environment so that um, you can get tailored and individualised advice for you. Right. Thank you, Asha, for leading us in that discussion on exercise, a really important tool to have in the toolbox. But you've got to work on something that you enjoy doing. You don't want it to be a drag. Mm. Thanks, Asha. Now, Kwan, you're coming in and out of my camera here, but I want everybody to hear from you today. I'm wondering if you can give, you're going to be our resident surgeon because Thomas must still be caught up in theatre. Would you be able to give a brief overview of the three surgical options that we offer here at our ALERT program? And Helen, you might be able to add some things after Kwan, if you don't mind. Thanks, Kwan. Sure. Can you hear me properly there? Yep, fantastic. So the uh, treatment of lymphedema, as you know, is primarily non-surgical meaning the majority of our patients do get uh, optimization through the various techniques that's been discussed. However, in some situations, those techniques are not adequate and or that the patient situation does not allow them to be able to follow through with compression garment, for example, such as I had a, an airline pilot who he would lose his job if he was going to wear a compression garment. Unfortunately, it was not um, he was not able to, to follow through with that. So in those situations, we look at surgical treatment options. And broadly speaking, there are two. So one is where you remove the fluid and or the fat, because we find that with time, lymphedema is not just a problem with fluid, but that fat deposition then occurs. So that is a debulking procedure. And, and that is liposuction, essentially. And that's where Professor Thomas Lamb uh, is an expert at, but unfortunately he's not here with us at the moment. And then the second broad category of procedures involve re-establishing in some ways the physiology of fluid drainage, i.e. try to improve the fluid drainage from the affected limb. So in order to affect that, we either transfer functioning lymph nodes from an unaffected part of the body selectively so that we don't damage the existing lymphatic drainage and transfer those nodes into the affected part of the body. Or the second way to affect that physiology restoration is to connect the lymphatic channels to a nearby venue mm. in order to bypass the blocked lymphatic. But in order to do that, we need to first determine that there are in fact some patent lymphatic collectors that are then obstructed at certain sites that we can then divert the, the draining portion of those lymphatic collectors into a nearby venule. 
So that's in the form of lymphovenous anastomosis. So I, I do both the lymphovenous anastomosis and the lymph node transverse. Excellent, Kwan. Thank you so much. And I've just seen on our participants of this uh, webinar today, we have patients and health professionals from all over the country. I know many of the names that I'm seeing here and I really welcome you. But we've also got people from New Zealand and I think probably nearly every state in the country, which is fantastic. And I will just share with you the results that um, over 50% of the people on this webinar are people living with lymphedema, at risk of lymphedema or lipedema or other chronic edemas. We've got some wonderful support people, friends or family members of someone living with these conditions. Mm -hmm. And then nearly 40% are, uh, are lymphedema therapists or allied health or other medical professionals working in this area, which is fantastic. So hopefully we've targeted at the right area. Now I have a question for you, Dr. Mackey. There's lots of questions for you actually. Um, there's lots of questions relating to cellulitis. Now, cellulitis is a common problem with lymphedema. And would you be able to share what are the early signs of cellulitis and what people listening to this webinar can do to pick up those early warning signs and what should they be doing about it? Thanks, Helen. So cellulitis is a complication of lymphedema because the lymphatics carry particular bacteria um, from the uh, tissue to the lymph nodes where the lymph nodes selectively destroy those uh, lymph, uh, uh, those back, that bacteria. Normally a lymph node will destroy 99.9% .9 of the bacteria that comes through it. But of course, if you've removed the lymph nodes, then there's going to be um, the, the area of uh, the limb is essentially immunocompromised, so it doesn't deal with infections, bacterial infections well. Um, the, 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 the clinical signs of, of cellulitis can be quite variable. Mostly people who do get cellulitis really learn pretty quickly what, how they manifest the signs of, uh, of cellulitis. Um, in some instances, uh, the, the first sign of cellulitis can be a high fever and rigors, that is shivering um, and, and quite being very unwell, even before the redness and heat of the um, cellulitis occurs. But the majority of times, it will start off with some areas of heat and redness or pain in, in the lymphedema limb. And... Um, and um, and then continue on, perhaps if you don't treat it, to, to the other signs of um, uh, fever and, and uh, pain and so on. So it, it can vary quite a lot. Um, I think that the, the message that I always give to people is this, if you do have cellulitis, you've got to remember it is a bacterial infection. It's not a viral infection. You do, do need antibiotics. Um, and so to, um, you need to be in a situation where if you've had cellulitis before and, and um, you've got some antibiotics close by. Um, there's one other problem with cellulitis is that when you have quite severe lymph uh, lymphedema, your skin is, is, is effectively inflamed. It's, it's um, got an in inflammation healing system going on. So in some instances, your leg or arm can become hot or red, particularly if you're taking off your garments, it can be quite patchy and red. If you don't have the ongoing symptoms of fever and, and being unwell malaise, then this may be what we call an inflammatory episode. In that case, we don't require antibiotics. But I think that if you um, you need to watch that if you don't have those symptoms, um, that overall those are the early signs. But it, it, it is highly variable, and there's not any clear, definite, single sign that will tell you that you've got cellulitis. Right. Thanks, Thanks, Helen. And a little a promotion here on the Australasian Lymphology Association, the ALA website. 
There is a position statement that Dr. Mackey was involved in writing with some other colleagues. That is a great resource for you to download from the ALA website, print a copy for yourself. And next time you go to visit your GP or health professional, you take a copy on the management of cellulitis to them so that we can try to raise awareness and better educate the health professionals that we're working with. Thank you, Helen. Now, I'm very aware of the time. We said we would run this webinar for 90 minutes. We are inundated by questions here, and I would really like to give each of our panel members the opportunity to answer at least one question. But I, I understand and respect that some people do need to go. It's dinner time and feeding young families or older families is really important. So I would like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar today. We will be sending out the recorded webinar with, um, to everyone who has registered for this webinar. Um, and we would welcome any feedback that you have so that we can propose future webinars or topics of interest. I would also like to thank our panel presenters and our presenters of the session today. Um, Rebecca for giving your personal story, Asha, Kim and Helen for presenting your um, very interesting work and your passion for working in this area. And for those who do have to leave us, um, please um, send us any further questions or contact our lymphedema clinic at Macquarie University, and we can certainly follow up with you. But we will make general comments and answers to all of the questions in themes and send them out to everyone who has attended this webinar. But for those who are able to stay for another few minutes, it's amazing. We've had over 200 people attending this webinar, which is fantastic for a Monday evening. And um, so I will just ask another couple of questions for say another five minutes and then we will finish the session. So Kim, I've got a couple of clinical questions for you. I hope you're up to it. Uh, we've had several questions. People have been very interested in the MLD, the manual lymphatic drainage as a self-management tool. Can you give a few tips on when people should do MLD and for how long they should be doing self-manual lymphatic drainage and what's the difference of self-MLD to going and seeing a therapist for full MLD session? Certainly. So the well, self-massage is obviously you doing the manual lymphatic drainage for yourself as opposed to you going to a therapist. So a therapist has two hands and perhaps more endurance than you might have, you or your partner might have in helping you, particularly if, if you know it's your arm and you've only got one hand to do your other arm. Um, so the frequency, the amount of time that you can put into it perhaps might differ to what your therapist can, but you can perhaps do one or two short sessions a day or every few days whereas to go to a therapist takes more time and perhaps a financial commitment um, I think the benefit of seeing a therapist is that they will get to know your limb and they'll be able to feel when something feels different to what it is usually or that trouble area that that you always feel is the area that swells if that's feeling better or worse because they're they're seeing you over a space of time as opposed to you every day thinking was oh, that a bit better is it a bit worse is it a bit better I'm not sure so there's benefits of either and both self and therapist manual lymphatic drainage as for how often it's a very individual thing and it comes back to dosage just as how much do you wear your compression garment? How, how often do you change them? How long or how often do you use a pump for? Um, it, it comes back to how much does your lymphedema need more management to keep you plain sailing? So if, you're, if you've got a very effective garment and you're physically active, you might not do as much manual lymphatic drainage as someone who perhaps doesn't tolerate or have as an effective garment um, or want to wear it as often. Um, so it, it's very much for you to work out for yourself what degree of management you want and how effective is that management for you. Great. Thanks, Kim. And I like the dosage analogy. And I often say to my own patients that if you are a diabetic patient, 
and you were required to take insulin to keep your diabetes under control, you would have to monitor the dosage to be able to give you the levels to maintain your blood sugars. With lymphedema, your self-management and your therapist management uh, required dosage depends on your condition, the severity of it, and your ability to be able to seek out that treatment. Thank you, Kim. Hero, we haven't forgotten you. We've got a question for you. Thank you. Um, now, Hero is our lymphatic anatomy specialist, our expert. And we've had some questions in regards to what is the latest research into lymphatic anatomy and how it impacts our management. We know here we've been teaching therapists and health professionals over the last few years about anatomy and physiology, understanding what's going on within the system. So could you um, share some of your knowledge and experience of latest research and how maybe we also use ICG in differentiating between lymphedema and lipedema? Yes, sure. So I started my career for the lymphatics for the investigating the anatomy of the lymphatics using the, the donated body. So that's my start. I still keep on learning and then investigating the normal anatomy using the, the human donated body. So recently I work together with uh, our collaborator, Dr. Shinaoka in Japan. So the one of the uh, one specific, the, our achievement to, so identify the injection site of the endocyne in green. So for example, it's a conventional lymphocytography is injecting a one or two uh, site in the web spaces, but we specify the four circumferential injection site on the third, depend on the, um, the, the anatomical finding in a donated body. So that helps us to uh, investigate in a comprehensive anatomy of the lymphatic system in the limb. So that's a one uh, the progress. As for the 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 lymphedema side, so working together with a lymphedema therapist is a wonderful opportunity. I already consider this uh, the idea when I was working in the United States, but actually happened in the Macquarie University. So that helps us a lot about the what's happening uh, the lymphedema. So then we find there are some specific drainage pattern in the arm and the leg lymphedema. So for example, is the arm we define the five distinct pattern of the lymphatic drainage region in the lymphedema, and also the leg for the eight distinct uh, lymphatic drainage region. So that's the imaging information is sometimes is different from the conventional, our understanding of the lymphedema. For example, um, didn't move towards uh, the growing lesion. So that's totally, it's against with the previous our understanding. So that helps a lot. And then finally, so um, fort fortunately, so then Macquarie Clinic, so we have an opportunity to see the many lipedema patient. And then we also have an opportunity to perform in the endocyning green infography for the lipedema patient. And then we can start a good understanding of the difference between the lymphedema and the lipedema. So the, for to date, so, and also to my experience, I haven't seen any of the lymphatic structure changes in the lipedema patient. So it's lymphatic the structure is anatomically looks normal, but in the lymphedema, even a slightly changes, so we can define by the, the endocyne green. That helps us to the, see the, uh, to distinguish the life edema and the lymphedema pretty well. So I, I really thank uh, all the patients who come into the Makuri to receive the, this uh, endocyne green infography. We're still learning, so how to interpret the information. Great, thank you, Hiro. And we're very grateful that you joined our team back in 2015 to bring this imaging to us. Now, we're going to have one more question because we have to welcome Associate Professor Thomas Lamb, who's just rushed out of theatre. I hope you finished the surgery properly, Thomas. 
to join our webinar this afternoon. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I'm not going to let you have to come up here without answering a question. You've joined there with Helen. And Helen, you can even probably contribute to this question. So we actually started liposuction surgery was the first thing that we came together as a team back in 2012. And you were the surgeon that we convinced to come on board and work with us to offer liposuction um, for surgery for lymphedema initially. And now you do also with lipedema patients. Can you advise us, Plant has already shared a little bit about like, uh, liposuction and the surgical technique, but maybe from your perspective, how have you seen the impact of liposuction affect people um, that you've operated on over the last eight years or so? Thanks, Louise. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry to be late. Uh, the, I, certainly over the years, I found that basically it, it is changing patients' quality of life. I Certainly some patients feel that it's life-changing totally because they are so bothered with one arm or one leg, which is two or three or four times larger than the other leg. And especially when it's on the legs, it's a real bother trying to walk properly. The gait's wrong, the, the spine's crooked, and it's just hard to do anything in, in, in life. So, so that is what I find. I find it's very satisfying. And we, are, we have to make it very clear. We are not curing the lymphedema, but we are removing the bulk of the heavy tissue that has become fatty. And uh, by putting, by making the arm or leg same size as the other side, often a little bit smaller even, uh, it just makes, makes everyday, everyday life back to normal in many sense, apart from still wearing a, a sleeve, but the sleeve is gonna be permanent no matter what. Uh, but the, the sleeve at least will be uh, easier to put on uh, and there's less chance of cellulitis. Uh, so, so I find it very satisfying surgery and, and the majority of patients uh, seem to think so as well. Good, thanks, Thomas. And you might just have a word there, Helen, because you were the, the guru who brought liposuction to our clinic. Any comments from you about the benefits of a multidisciplinary approach to assessing and managing this condition? So um, after um, 20 or so years of watching all our therapists and the, the patients doing so much hard work that in some cases, just still having a very large limb, I was uh, struck by the chance to um, uh, use liposuction to do bulk the limb. Um, uh, and with, um, with all the surgery we do, the selection of the patient is really, really critical. We don't operate on everyone. Um, we try and make sure that if you're going to go to an operation, you get the best out of it as possible. Um, and um, I think I agree, we've watched people through many years now and we've seen um, excellent uh, improvement in quality of life. Um, and uh, we've been very lucky to see that it's, it, it is life changing for many people. Thank you, Helen. Well, I feel very privileged as a director of this amazing team here at Alert at Macquarie University. I'm really grateful to you, Rebecca, for giving up your time prior to this session to record your presentation and then to join us today and to share your personal journey with us. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank my colleagues. Um, these sort of events don't happen without a lot of organisation in the background. And my side person here, you put the camera on for me, is Philippa Sutton. Philippa is in the office with me, handing me notes and we're, we've been managing this together. We've had an enormous amount of questions from you who are participating and listening to this session. We had over 50 questions before we started the session. And I think we've probably had over 80 to 100 questions throughout this 90 minute session. So as I mentioned earlier, we will do our best to group the questions because there are lots of themes of questions that are coming in. But obviously there's still lots of questions and lots of information that people want to know about this condition. And we will do our best as the Alert Centre of Excellence here at Macquarie University to keep doing what we're doing to offer clinical program with a great team of 
health professionals. We will do research and we'll publish it so that we can get answers to the questions that we have. And we will teach health professionals so that we're increasing the diverse nature of this lymphedema, lipedema, other chronic conditions so that everyone can access best practice. So thank you for joining us. We've still got over 150 people online with us and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thanks everyone. And we will send you the recording um, in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye.